Thanks for joining us for another Contagion Coronavirus video. Today, we will be talking about Kalitra. So why don't we start with talking with our guest today, who is Dr. Krutika Mediwala, who recently hosted a webinar on the SIDP website about Kalitra. Thanks for joining me, and let's get started. So can you describe the mechanism of action of Kalitra? Yeah, thanks a lot for having me on. Um, so Kalitra works as an antiviral agent for HIV. It's included in uh, part of our post-exposure prophylaxis. It actually works by inhib inhibiting the HIV-1 protease, which leads to the formation of some immature and non-infectious viral particles. Um, this is similar to what we hypothesized that it works in the SARS coronavirus, except the main protease in SARS is um, the chymotrypsin-like protease or the 3CL protease, and that's where um, we hypothesized that Kalitra may inhibit this protease, leading to similar results such as um, HIV. And then we also have that ritonavir component in the combo um, that inhibits the CYP3A4 metabolism of the ritonavir component, so that way we have increased serum levels in the drug combo. Great, thank you. So um, what are some of the existing data that we have on Kalitra with other coronaviruses like SARS or MERS? Yeah, so there's uh, um, quite a few data for SARS and MERS um, when Kalitra comes into the picture. There are in vitro data, however, um, they are kind of basically equivocal. Um, there's various EP50s, which is like the 50% effective concentration that's needed. Um, and then there's most of them that say, like, with no help from ritonavir as well. So at that, um, in my research, I was able to find some positives and some not so positives to kind of just balance out the data. Um, for animal data, there's really not that anything that I could find in SARS. So MERS does have some data in primates and mice. Um, they did do a study in primates where they compared, like, an untreated control um, one with mycophenolate and um, another group with interferon and then a Kalitra group. Um, and the Kalitra group demonstrated that they had improved mean clinical scores and some um, a lower mean viral load in the lungs. Um, looking at the mice models, um, they didn't find any, um, they compared it to remdesivir um, and interferon and what they found was um, they did not display any superior activity when they compared it to the two other drugs. Um, when it comes to human data, I wanted to keep, just keep um, this in mind that most of them have been done in combo with ribavirin and steroids. Um, so all these studies will have that as a component, and then they either add Kalitra or not to the um, treatment group. Um, so SARS, in SARS, it shows like early use may um, show less intubation in patients, have um, less corticosteroid therapy needed, um, and even less risk of death. The, um, they did another study that showed significantly less patients developed ARDS or death um, within 21 days of discharge. So MERS, and this was kind of a unique study, they did one in post-exposure prophylaxis in healthcare workers, um, and that showed that giving patients um, this drug in combination with some of the supportive care um, showed a 40% decrease in risk of subsequent MERS infection. They don't talk a lot about some of the adverse events that could take place, so we'll talk a little bit about that later on, but um, most severe adverse drug events were noted in any of these studies. Great. Thank you um, for that information. So I guess my next question is, um, Kalitra has been studied in an open-label individualized trial in China. So what data have we seen from that research so far? Yeah, so there, before this open label individual life trial in China, there were a couple of case reports that came out. Um, but this case report essentially kind of sealed the deal for um, lack of use of choice in these patients. So they looked at some SARS 30 positive, PCR positive patients, and they compared them to standard care um, plus Kalitra or, or just standard care. Um, and that was just symptomatic therapy mostly. And what they found was there was no difference in the primary outcome and um, of time to clinical improvement or mortality. Um, and they also didn't find any decrease in the viral loads with Kalitra either. I did want to point out that the median time, median time before symptom onset um, to randomization was about 13 days. So that's kind of a long time when you're looking at just like the course of COVID-19. Um, and then 
the other part, or like some of the pulses for the study was that they did have a uh, pretty high mortality rate, about 22%. So they did have some really sick patients that they looked at in the study, um, which is helpful. Great. Um, thank you so much for that summary of that data. Um, so I guess my next question for you would be, um, are there any serious concerns associated with Kalitra in regards to adverse reactions or any drug-drug interactions? Yeah, so Kalitra does have significant adverse reactions. Um, so these can be some hypersensitivity reactions like angioedema as well. Um, some people may have like toxic epidermal necrolysis or Stephen Johnson's. It can prolong the QT and cause some arrhythmias. Um, it also has a lot of adverse events related to some um, hypertriglyceridemia, um, anemia, leukopenia, neutropenia. Um, can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. A lot of the studies that looked at this, a patient, and most of these studies did um, report nausea, vomiting, diarrhea as some of the most common adverse events. Um, it is contraindicated in some severe cardiac disease, um, where the patients already have cardiomyopathy, structural heart disease, and tissue prolongation. If you look at our patients that are um, really at high risk of COVID-19, we've heard a lot about um, patients with cardiac disease as being at high risk of, um, you know, acquisition as well as mortality. So it so may potentiate some of that issue as well. And the last thing when it comes to drug-drug interaction, like I mentioned before, it is um, that the ton of your component does have the CYP3A4 inhibition. So it interacts with um, some of our other HIV meds, our um, hepatitis C meds, some antifungals, enerone, tacrolimus. So some of these, like, um, drugs that are really important for immune-compromised patients, um, it's very important to kind of run, run, run that drug-drug interaction check. So my next question for you is actually one that we received from an attendee of a Contagion webinar that we had this past week. Um, and that audience member wanted to ask if you have any comments on the ribavirin and Kalitra combination. Sure. So, the, like I mentioned before, most of the studies that have looked at um, for SERS and MERS um, for Kalitra as a treatment option did have ribavirin on um, as well as one of the standards of therapy. Um, and then plus minus, they had um, dose of these steroids as well. And so, if you look at that literature, the, uh, the Kalitra dose um, studied was a, like range from like 1.2 to 2.4 grams up to three times a day. Um, and that compared to what we normally use ribavirin for, those cases are very, very, very high. Um, and we really worry about the tolerability of the toxicity that this can cause in our patients. Um, specifically, the risk of hemorrhagic toxicity is too high. So based on all of the data that you've included and the available information, what is your final opinion on um, Kalitra in regards to COVID-19 treatment? So based on this data that I think um, Kalitra does not appear to have any clinical benefits and clinical improvement or decreasing viral load in SARS-CoV-2. Um, that being said, we really, um, you know, we have other options that have kind of come into the front line. Um, so I think we really need a little bit more data. We've had, uh, I would say, a total of three to four studies that um, have displayed that there's just not a potential option. Um, so it's kind of been taking a back seat with that um, right now. So then my last question for you is, what is your advice to clinicians who are trying to stay up to date on all of the um, news coming out about COVID-19 while also treating patients and trying to, you know, stay, um, you know, focused on um, treatment? Yeah, so I would say, obviously, the Contagion website um, and then Twitter. Like, I think I hop on Twitter twice a day um, to just kind of do a little literature check and see what all has come out. Um, there's some accounts that are really good to follow that really are on top of things. Um, but that being said, we are in a time where um, we are clearly trying to push for information to get out there so quickly. Um, so that kind of puts us at risk of um, having pre-quick journal articles, um, pre-reviewed journal articles um, as well. So really, I try to, you know, take 
what is out there and then really do a good job of discussing it with my colleagues because that's our, like, I call it my internal um, peer review of what is out there because I appreciate the transparency, but we still need to be really um, diligent in doing our um, the work behind that it takes to really look at the flaws of the study, the pluses of the study, um, is it feasible to do it in our population, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I would say Twitter, continue to and then talk with your colleagues. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And for anyone who's interested in watching the SAP, SIDP webinar, you can access that on their website. Um, so thanks again and stay well. Thanks for having me on.